I've been watching the alley outside my window for a couple years now. The alley runs alongside the house where I stay in an upstairs room on the second floor. There's a couple reasons why people come in the alley mainly. They come to use the bathroom and people store stuff here too. Things they can't take with them in the homeless shelters. And they shoot up or smoke crack. A lot of the people though, they're just here to get away, to get out of the street where a lot of people end up waiting, trying to get in the homeless shelters. The more I watch the alley, where they sometimes stage film shoots, or where my neighbor cuts his lawn with a tractor, the more I wanted to know about this whole larger area in Detroit, this neighborhood. This is the lower corridor, part of the larger Cass Corridor. It was also called Chinatown, when the Chinese set up businesses and moved here starting in the 1960s. They ran along Cass Street in the center of the lower corridor. But Chinatown didn't last here. This area, it's had the reputation for being one of the roughest places in the city for more than a hundred years. The house where I stay is just a block away from Cass Street, from where Chinatown used to be. And there used to be Victorian houses just like it, up and down these streets. Since the arsons and fires and the crack epidemic in the 1980s, a lot of this area has been wiped out. And I can see pretty clear over this whole neighborhood now. Or what's left of it. When I first started watching this area, and the people outside my window. I did think it was strange that people would come in the alley without going through it. Like this one man, he was trying to get comfortable all day in the alley. And I started watching people on other streets too. There are people who took turns sleeping on the porch across the street from the alley. One summer, I watched a lot of different people coming there to smoke crack on the porch. I always noticed they were over there by the long flame in the distance. Because there's not a lot of police that come through this area. People sometimes come here to do what they can't do elsewhere. Once in a while, you do see some police, like when they've chased someone here. And one time they came to protect this painting class in the middle of the day in my backyard. It is sort of strange that cops don't come down these streets more often. Since a lot of the drugs in the area, they only get sold a block away. The guys are out there all winter and at nights when it's really cold. It turns out this area, 
It's been a kind of center for drugs. And prostitution. For a long time now. I would say up to 20 years ago, you might see girls walking. But as time passed, they would be more of the bottom of the barrel girls. This is according to my neighbor, at least. Wes. He's lived next door to the crack house on Park Street his whole life. You know what I mean? I started to ask other people in the area, too, what they knew about the corridor, being a kind of red light district in the city. Back in the 70s, that was what this neighborhood was known for, was the prostitutes. I think my earliest memory around here was at Burton School. I was in kindergarten. And a friend of mine, we were playing, and I asked him, how come your mom's always outside the school in her pajamas? I, I didn't realize that she was a prostitute and she was out there in, a, you know, these lingerie kind of things. George grew up in the Cass Corridor in the 1960s. He says he's had family on both sides of the law, cops and criminals. It's a cliche to say, oh, my friends are dead or in prison. That's true. It's actually true. You know, a lot of my friends that I grew up with are either dead or they're in Jackson prison. Very few until the end did the drug thing start with the prostitutes here, which would have been pretty, yeah, very classy. No, not trashy, classy. And then that drug, you know, it was so great, you'd run into someone And then you got later. nasty and fights and all that nasty stuff. But for, for about, God, almost to 1980, wasn't it? Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. The Cass Corridor. To many people, it's a symbol of everything that's wrong with Detroit. You need only look at the vacant buildings, the deserted streets, and the high crime rate to come to the conclusion that it's not exactly what you'd call a tourist attraction. But if you took a closer look, you'd find a thriving little business called the Birdtown Pet Store. And you'd also find a whole lot that's right about our city. Pat and Gary, they now run an antique store in the lower corridor. But for 40 years before that, they ran a place called Birdtown, a pet shop in the same place. Oh yeah, we get into the people, you know, and uh, they're all, unique everybody's different down here and they're just real people it's a way of life i mean we're here we enjoy it if we didn't we wouldn't be here pat and gary went through a lot here over the years their place was even firebombed once and all the animals died but the community helped rebuild it i asked them how dangerous the neighborhood really got to be when businesses around them all started to close. From the time I was here in 68, it was always the prostitution thing, which along with that comes drugs, right? But that's kind of isolated right within that, that world of pimps and prostitutes, right? A lot of the prostitutes fend for themselves. Um, well, some did, Gary. That, that's another story. Yeah. But the pimps were black. The right. prostitutes were white. And uh, as times and things uh, mixed here more, because this was an all-white neighborhood. This neighborhood, physically, there were barriers. There, there were demarcation lines, very clear ones. Um, the lodge to the west. You had the Fisher to the south, downtown, cutting that off. And Wayne State to the north. And Woodward, which isn't as physical of a, that's a mental demarcation line, even more powerful than the other ones, because we didn't go across Woodward. Most of the kids, and I'm talking about kids here. I'm just a kid, I'm walking down Woodward Avenue South and where the Vietnam Veterans Center is now, there was a place called Greenfields. A real nice restaurant back in those days. And there are nothing but white people in there. And you know, we can't go in. And then I walk down the street and there's a place to, a haircut. So I go in, they said, we don't cut black hair and that kind of stuff. So these are things that, while they were not earth shattering, they were in the sense that they manifested a certain attitude. People were very, very firm about blacks not moving into their territory. You know, there's very, there's a lot of, of heavy prejudice in this area. There were no blacks. In 1970, there were no blacks. No. That lived in this neighborhood that you know to be the Cass Corridor. Late 50s, early 60s, uh, it don't matter how much money you had, 
If you was a certain color, you had to stay in a certain neighborhood. Black people lived on 4th Street, but when you go over to 3rd, 3rd was white. 2nd was white. Cass was white. Yeah. It was like a little neighborhood. Darylin, she grew up in the Jeffries projects. These were just west of the corridor, on the other side of the freeway. The Brewster projects, they were on the east side of the corridor. This is where Joe Lewis and Diana Ross grew up. Black people lived around the corridor, mostly in these projects. But the inside of the corridor mostly stay white. We even had two restaurants on third, and one was called the white restaurant, one was called the black restaurant. And it was only because white people on that one and black people on that one. So where you go, I'm going to a restaurant, the white restaurant, I'm going to, no, I'm going to a white restaurant, get a hamburger. Oh, no, I'm going to a black restaurant, get some barbecue. Ron also grew up in the Jeffries projects. Charlotte and Peter and all those were white. They were the remnants of the people who lived on that side of West uh, Woodward, which was white. But they stayed or couldn't leave because of the economics. So as a result of it, they were Southern white people primarily. Southern white people, they brought their music to the lower corridor. They also brought a lot of bars. The bars on 3rd Street were known for late night fights. There's a bar in every block. Down here, there was Bill, Bill Bailey. If you went in there on Friday night, you could, you can guarantee there'd be a fight erupt every 20 minutes. I asked George why so many Appalachians, why they even came to the corridor in the first place. The coal mines no longer could support them and, and uh, lumbering could no longer support them. So the only alternative was to come to, to where they made cars. And why the corridor? Because this was the port of entry. You know, all the, the, the apartments around, you know, were cheap living. This was uh, the port of entry here for the whites and uh, the other side of Woodward's the port of entry for the blacks. George is a teacher at community colleges, sociology mainly. He leads tours of his neighborhood, trying to teach people about the area. I always take students on a trip, field trip, and the field trip is really eye-opening and shocking. I don't, I don't try to make it shocking, but it's shocking. You know, that you've got homeless living on the street and homeless living under rugs hung up on a tree and you know, that, that, those types of things. George and his wife, Patsy, they have a lot of land now in the lower corridor. They try and live off what they grow in the backyard. We bought our house for $7,250 in 68. I think there were six lots in all. The uh, Horseshoe Bar was bombed in, in 70, 1970, and it burned. So that sat here for a long time and we made a garden out of it. The others burned and we just extended the garden. Originally, a lot of the industrialists came from this area. The people that had money invested in the area. Detroit was the manufacturing center. People were coming from all over the world and from the South to work in industry. And you had a lot of uh, poor people, barefoot kids speaking other language running the streets and a lot of density of population there. It destroyed the quality of life. So they moved out starting about 1910. And the neighborhoods went from the richest neighborhood to the poorest neighborhood. When I first moved to the area, I lived down the street and rented a place there for $60 a month. That's when you, could, you couldn't find apartments around here. You couldn't find rooms around here. The auto plants were all uh, factories for making uh, wartime vessels. Everything had become geared to the war, see? And that's why this was the arsenal of democracy, because you already had factories in place. So you shift from making this to making that. Even though George talks about 
how much work there was in Detroit in the 1960s. My dad came here from New York in the early 40s. People came to Detroit because there was work. And uh, when uh, the war was over, uh, a lot of people stayed. George E. didn't stay, though. He grew up in the quarter with my dad, and he left for California as soon as he could after the war. The very first memory that I have is living close to where old Chinatown was. And from there, we moved to Charlotte and Park. So Charlotte and Park is really where most of my life as a young boy was. And that was where the site of our laundry. And we used to play touch football here, you know. And this was a vacant lot, and we built a, a clubhouse here. So this must have been the laundromat here. Well, it wasn't a laundromat. It was, nobody knew what a laundromat was. It was a Chinese laundry. My mother ran the laundry where Bill and I and my sister and my brother Frank, we all grew up there. My dad's best friend was actually George's brother, Bill Yi. He worked in the laundry every day after school. When he was 16, he joined the Navy, and George joined the Marines. They were all trying to escape the neighborhood. My dad describes it as being rough even then. See, we had a gang around the neighborhood, so you could think in the neighborhood you were safe. But if you went out of the neighborhood, you better figure out what gang is over there. One time I came out of my house, 74 Charlotte, which is still there, and I was walking down the street and I got to the alley and there was a gang from several blocks away. Where are you going? Blah, 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 blah. They busted an egg on my head and took off. So you're stuck in your own neighborhood and you were very wary of what gang uh, sponsors this particular spot this particular neighborhood. If the cast quarter was rough when my dad was a kid, it got worse when the Skid Row area of Detroit. It moved there in the early 1960s. The original Skid Row was south of downtown, a mile from Cass Corridor. Skid Row had blocks of cheap bars. People living in makeshift tents on the street. Public drunkenness. And people living on the street. For years, the city debated about what to do with Skid Row. And what to do with all the people on the street there so close to the downtown. In the end, the city just tore the whole place down. And this one picture, published afterwards, it shows how this area was just cleared out. Skid Row ended up moving down the street to the lower cast corridor, where there are already bars, migrant and transient people. But the men of Skid Row, they weren't the only ones moving to the cast corridor. The original Chinese settlement in Detroit, they were moving there too. Old Chinatown, it was next door to Skid Row. Chinatown had had markets and schools set up, a clinic. There were 53 restaurants and over 3,000 Chinese people living there. But Chinatown happened to be too close to the old Skid Row. And so the city bulldozed their neighborhood too as part of their slum clearance. I asked Georgie 
what old Chinatown was like before the place got tore down. Chinatown, the one main street there was where Chung's the restaurant was. And the other family that was there was the Chins, and they owned the produce store. I remember my dad taking me there a couple of times, and you know I could barely see you know what was going on. I remember guys putting their hands on my head, pushing, pushing my head down, or somebody handing me an orange. There were a lot of families living here when they when the Chinatown was moved over here from Michigan and Third. Don, he grew up in Old Chinatown too, but 30 years later, he's not related to George. His father had the first noodle factory in Detroit. Our original noodle factory was at Third in Michigan. And then you were forced to move. Right, because the city bought out Chinatown to build a new international village for the Chinese, but they did not have enough funds to proceed with the international village, but they did knock down Chinatown. That's why Chinatown became over at Peterborough and Cass. Not having enough funds, that might be one way of explaining it. Another way would be to say that Chinatown was made of Asian immigrants and that they didn't quite matter. In the end, the Chinese moved to the Lower Cass Corridor, to Peterborough and Cass, just like the men from Skid Row. They set up markets and restaurants again and had festivals in the new spot. But the new Chinatown it never became what the original place had been. And a lot of Chinese felt their neighborhood had been destroyed in the move. I think basically during the 80s, it was shutting down. Chinatown was dissolving. Probably the decline that you try match the decline of Chinatown. As Chinatown was shutting down, Crime was going up in the corridor, all over the city. There is no denying the city has tremendous problems. Tremendous problems. Let me give you a little recap of the segment on prime time, which pretty much concluded Detroit is a place lost in despair beyond the point of no return. In the last decade, nearly a third of all auto workers lost their jobs and blacks were hit hardest. Detroit's unemployment rate is staggering. Infant mortality is twice the national average, and almost three times as many Detroiters fall below the poverty line. The mayor will tell you that the reason Detroit's so bleak is because it's so black. It's not accidental that the cities around the nation that have the largest percentage of blacks, have the largest percentage of poverty, have the largest percentage of crime have the larger percentage of unemployment. In my time in Detroit, I have driven and walked past mile after mile of decayed, rotting neighborhoods that look like war zones, of burned out buildings, I cracked houses. If, you, if you've been coming in any length of time, those were there when I became mayor. And a whole lot of that's been restored. There are also people that say that any white mayor who had developed the downtown area and let the neighborhoods collapse would have been kicked out of office a long time ago. Well, that's bull****. That's pure propaganda. Neighborhoods collapsed because half the goddamn population left. And this is right when drugs, one kind of drug in particular, was really taking over. Do you think there's something specific about crack that infiltrated some neighborhoods and destroyed them and destroyed them at a rate that was different than all these other drugs? Oh, yeah, I think crack was um, the uh, neutron bomb uh, for the African-American community. Crack destroyed this neighborhood. That kind of leveled everything. And there's, there's a um, saying that people, I remember this distinctly, that crack's the only pimp around here now. Cocaine, crack cocaine, uh, which was uh, like uh, the chitlins of cocaine, if you choose that it was dropped in the same way that chitlins were dropped in 
with uh, the diet, you know? And uh, it made it tear, it destroyed the community, destroyed the neighborhoods, destroyed people. It just happened so fast. We couldn't figure out why would it hit the neighborhood so twice it felt fast. Because we were surrounded by buildings. And then within a month or two, they're all empty. 700 and some people lived in that block over there. And then there was nobody. A couple of years later, there's nobody lived there. But not everyone here says that this happened at the same time. What were you saying, that this area didn't used to be the Cass Corner? No, not when I was coming up, it wasn't called Cass Corner. All this was up looking real nice, serious, you know, and all the lots around here, it was buildings, we were stores, you know, on all of these streets. And when did things start to change? After a riot. It really got bad. A lot of people that stayed here that had money and businesses, they started burning their businesses, getting their insurance money, moving on across eight miles. Maybe because you live through it, you don't see it in this way, but growing up, you know, probably as a white person, I, I, you know, I think I got fed a picture that was the beginning of the ghost townization was the riots. Mm -hmm. If people needed an excuse to leave, the riots gave them a good excuse to get out. I've got to keep my family safe. And uh, I, I need to get my mother out. My mother's living all by herself in this house, and we've got to get her out. The riots in 1967, or rebellion, they were one of the worst in U.S. history in terms of the number of people who got killed and the damage that was done. After 67, people and industry and businesses moved out. I remember a sign, a bumper saying, last person out, please turn out the lights. Because they were going. And now they're coming back. Everyone does seem to be saying that Detroit is really changing now. There is a lot of construction in the area and deconstruction. It almost seems like the whole area is getting torn down and rebuilt all at once. There's a lot of new loss being made and buildings getting rehabbed, changing into loss. And there's one really big project coming to the lower corridor that hopes to totally remake this place. Tomorrow morning here in downtown Detroit, it's out with the old to make way for the new as the historic Park Avenue Hotel comes down. Lou Tuller opened the Park Avenue Hotel back in 1925 to much fanfare. A $2 million building with 250 rooms in the bustling business, shopping, and entertainment district. Detroit says farewell to the Park Avenue just two months shy of the building's 90th anniversary. The implosion over there is set to begin tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. In downtown Detroit, Mike Wolfo, 7 Action News. Today, the Detroit City Council giving two big thumbs up on the Red Wings' new arena. To let the new Red Wings <laughs> yeah. Arena Entertainment District move forward, of course, this is a project that's expected to change the face of Detroit. The Red Wings Arena, it is going to be built right here along Woodward. There will be two new buildings that will house Olympia Development's offices and the Red Wings offices. Along Henry Street, there will be a couple new buildings where people will have retail businesses, entertainment businesses, and right across the street, townhouses will be built so people can live right next to all of the excitement. The news has been talking a lot about the arena excitement. Trying to get us to use our imaginations about what this place could be. Just imagine these abandoned buildings and vacant lots behind me, part of a new vibrant downtown Detroit. The Illich organization says it can be done in three years. Critics say only time will tell if it's a transformation the city needs. I think it's gonna be great. 
it'll get more people out. It'll bring revenue, it'll bring people outside the city in the city, so it's got to help bring jobs. This place will be booming year-round. The amazing thing about the Illich plan, the $650 million complex plan where, you know, they get uh, half of the money to build the arena from taxpayers, is that it happened after years of secrecy, of years of them buying dozens of property and me trying to find the pattern that there is something going on here and them denying it for at least two years. And then suddenly, when it is announced, it's announced that it's already been passed by the state legislature, that this is going to happen in this neighborhood. It's a huge power play. Uh, this thing is just going through so efficiently through the system that even if you were against it, and I don't know if most people are because they're so overwhelmed by the idea. The Illich family is like royalty in Detroit, Michigan. Mike and Marianne Illich, the creators of Little Caesars Pizza in 1959, have owned the Detroit Red Wings since 1982 and the Detroit Tigers since 1992. It's been in the works for a while. But because it's been so gradual and I has a jump start here and a start here, uh, that, that people think of it only in terms of immediate situation. But it's like uh, underdeveloping or allowing it to be underdeveloped so you could get it cheap and then move it real rapidly. There were like 22 land sales, secret land sales in Cass Corridor between Temple and Woodward and Cass and the freeway, which is the exact spot where the arena is going to be built. So they just waited it out. They just needed all the property before they were gonna make the announcement. And when they did finally make the announcement, some people in the area, they seem to have a lot of enthusiasm about it. Like at Pat and Gary's store. Does it get any better than Illich? I mean, think where we'd be without Illich in this city right now. How bad off we are. How bad off would we be without Illich? I don't know. Oh, oh bad? absolutely. That's not just going to be a stadium. It's going to be a full-fledged yeah, uh, retail, retail space, everything. So it's mega. Just like this corner oh, years ago. And it's coming this way because people are willing to invest and start a business because there's people wanting to live because in of downtown. Village. Because of it. This is what Pat and Gary were saying, a couple years ago at least, before the arena had really been announced, and before property sales took off. We're around yeah. tomorrow and the next day. It was after that that they got noticed to vacate, and they had to have a fire sale of all of their stuff. I asked Gary how he felt about having to leave this corner, where they'd been for so long where the pet shop had been for even longer. Gary said that he thought of his store and the one around the corner as something permanent in the neighborhood. Were the, the two stones on this whole square. And he said we, we could have had Well, if we make it till Monday. We're gonna make it, Pam, we're gonna make it. We'll have spent 45 years in this block. Different businesses and companies here. They bought this whole corner now on Peterborough and Cass and properties across the street and down the block. Basically, most of Chinatown's sold now. So they're technically all uh, new owners now. The person in five is going to make this into a tattoo place, and he was going to put the facade like it was back in uh, Chinatown days. After Don's father's noodle business closed, Don became a real estate agent, selling most of what is left of Chinatown. A few years ago, I, I sold these. And I saw down the street some of the other Chinese stores down the block. And no one would want these properties because they were not worth anything until the stadium projects came in. But the stadium projects 
They didn't just come in, of course. We now know why someone had been buying up land in the corridor for so long. Tearing buildings down, clearing out the land, making what looks like a big empty space, ready for new development. Even though on the news the Illiches talk about how well the arena will do, because they know the city so well. There are other people in the area who think differently. You seem so convinced that this is gonna work. This is gonna work. What makes you so convinced? We know this city very well. We know the people of this city very well. We know what they're interested in, what they'll respond to. Illich and all come in and get the old cast corner down by downtown Fisher Freeway for a song and a dance to build a big uh, sports palace again, case may be. But, uh, and they say they're going to build housing. Well, is that housing going to be multi-income? Is it going to be upscale? I contend upscale. I live downtown. I see what's happening to the rents and the, and, you know, uh, the purchases. If you look at pro sports, um, I don't think anyone would say pro sports in America are on the decline. <laughs> if anything, they're on the increase. Americans love their sports. And you know what? I'd say Detroiters love their sports even a little more than the average American. But maybe not every Detroiter. People, I think, basically want to believe a lot of good stuff. They want to believe it. You think a big state would be a lot for Detroit, but it's going to be a lot of low-wage jobs that barely help people pay their bills, which everything is still getting higher. You say, okay, I'm gonna take a stand. I'm gonna do this. But then if it's just you taking a stand and nobody else is doing it, you know, that takes a lot of energy. You, you, you oh, let, 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 let's all boycott uh, the Red Wing Stadium, okay? We don't even, why, we don't even like hockey, so they don't care. A lot of stuff that Illich and all of these other guys do, nobody's there to raise the question. And to challenge those things that are not right and not fair and not just in terms of uh, living space. It's gonna be mostly upper class white people or upper class black people who have the money to do it. Everybody else is gonna get pushed out. It's gonna be, what they say, a rich man's playground. That's what it's going to be. And does it make you less um, excited when you hear the talk about this? It Detroit? makes me much less excited, especially when I heard about how Detroit is really getting almost nothing from the proceeds from that Red Wing Stadium. I think that Illich is extremely greedy. Sports teams are successful businesses with wealthy owners, and yet they still get our help. Two years ago, Detroit got approval to spend more than $280 million in taxpayer money on a new arena project for the Red Wings, just six days after the city filed for bankruptcy. Even though the Red Wings owner is Mike Illich, the founder of the Little Caesars pizza chain, who's worth an estimated 5.1 billion. That's a little hard to swallow. I mean, sure, not as hard to swallow as a Little Caesars crazy bread <laughs> with an assortment of Caesar dips, but still pretty hard. And we don't just help teams build stadiums. We let them keep virtually all the revenue those stadiums then produce. A major review of almost 20 years of studies showed economists could find no substantial evidence that stadiums had increased jobs, incomes, or tax revenues. His vision is, 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 is not lucid because the damage that you're being done is not, it's not going to be worth it. They think it is, but it's not going to work out. What are you going to do with all these people? What's going to happen? You're going to have all these people coming in, and you're going to have all these venues, and we can't even get to our homes. It's already happening where people are getting moved out of their places because they can't afford it. Literally next week, uh, there are going to be about 20 or 30 low-income residents who are getting kicked out of their apartment complex because it's been bought by an uh, out-of-state developer and the rent is three times than what they pay. And so they have to leave very quickly. And often these are people who have disabilities or no 
transportation. There is no transportation here. Um, there is, there's buses here, but they do not come on time. They come an hour late. The couple I met, one was on physical disabilities. They lived together. And the thing is, they had found a place to live, but they didn't have the money to actually move. The place found for them was on the east side, like on Seven Mile. And neither of them drive, and they were all scrambling to physically move, to find the help to get out and move to their new location. Us moving over here compared to living in Detroit, downtown Detroit, I think there's a big difference. I'm over on the east side, I have no idea where I am. I liked living downtown because there was more things going on, you know? There was more interesting people downtown. I've always been downtown. I've always worked down now. We're you like know? unconnected now. Right, yeah, it's kind of like we're just placed in this spot that is like not a real comfortable yeah. spot. We have not made ourselves at home at all. Home, for Molly and Ronnie, it had been the town apartments. There have been a lot of evictions like these, all over downtown. At the Albert, a couple blocks away, 130 people got evicted. This used to be where low-income seniors and disabled people lived for decades downtown. If you've been here 20 years and you're in your 80s and 90s, what do you do now? We don't better, no and it's a shame. It's a rotten shame. We worked in this city, you understand? Yep. We made this yep. city. The world may know Detroit is Motown, but some believe it could easily be renamed. A lot of people believe it should be called Gilbert Town. Oh, no, no. Dan Gilbert oh, may balk at that notion, but with 55 to 60 buildings under the wing of his various companies, it's not too far-fetched. Gilbert now has 80 buildings under his wing, and most people think he has plans for more. This is what Gilbertville looks like. It's a model of the city. Every time Dan Gilbert buys another building, its miniature replica lights up. A lot of the new cost of living downtown, it's been fueled by Dan Gilbert's move here in 2010. His employees get subsidized rent downtown and there's a bus system built for them and a security camera system to help keep everybody safe. Some people say he's acting like a land baron here or a big brother, but mostly he gets really good press. Many credit the founder of Quicken Loans with a Motor City comeback that's now on the fast track. He employs 12,500 people, and 20% of them call Detroit's urban core home. You can't even rent an apartment down here in downtown. There's like a one-year waiting list. It's crazy, crazy to, to fathom that, but that's true. We're at 100% occupancy in residential, both in downtown and in midtown. I don't think there's been any other time in the history of Detroit where really big swaths of the city are being controlled, influenced by really two billionaires, Dan Gilbert downtown and the Illich family in Cass Corridor. What's going on in Lower Cass Corridor is really quite profound in terms of the money being made, the potential, the ownership. Every week I could cover a, a restaurant or something coming back. You know, last week I just covered this men's designer store about to open up where he's going to sell like $1,800 coats and $200 shirts. That's a pretty strange thing happening at the same time. And so to me, the question is, who is going to have to leave in Cass Corridor? What is the system for them to find something else? I talked to other people too on monthly or weekly rates in the corridor. Like Johnny Cummings. He's at the King's Arms Hotel. I asked him how long he had been there. I stayed at this hotel a couple of times, moved out and came back all together probably three years. 
you can pay by the month or by the week of a month. I pay by the month. So yeah, it's like three hundred and sixty dollars a month. Johnny, I know you told me about different places you lived, but you never told me if you were ever didn't have a place to live. Oh, I've been I've been like that three or four times, four or five, three or four times. Yeah, I I, I was out, you know, until I got my check and got my, you know, some. I might have found the place while I was out there, and, you know, guy. I've been out there like that yeah, until I got a place. Yeah. JC is someone else in the corridor who's been out like that before too. Now he checks on other homeless people in the corridor, like Christina. She stores her stuff behind the sign when panhandling. When I was out there, people helped me, you know, and I didn't have to be out there neither, you know, but I chose to. The, the road that I went down was a bad road, and I ended up out there, you know, like that. But JC isn't out there anymore. When I first met him and his friend Johnny Taylor, they were staying in an apartment right in the middle of where the new arena development will be. About 400 people here will be getting evicted. This building has houses a lot of seniors here. I mean, super seniors. You got people that's living here, been in here 30 and 35 years since way back in the day. So you max, you can imagine the impact that would have had on them. You know, you've been here most of your life, and all of a sudden, giving you like 60 days to get up out. But I can imagine the person that you this is home to them. You know, this was home to them. This is home to them. A lot of these places that were home in the corridor cheaper apartments and hotels. For a lot of people, they're the difference between having a place to stay and not having one. With so much of the corridor now changing, a lot of the shelters, they'll have to change now too. Some of them will have to close, as there is new pressure here about what to even do with the homeless. And it makes it worse when a lot of the cheaper apartments that were in the corridor, they're now not available. I talked to different people who stay in some of the shelters around here. Like Leroy Palmer. He's at Cots, a homeless shelter at the end of my street. I guesstimate about 200 people here. And if it's a little more, I approximately know everybody here. I'm always around. I take turns volunteering, doing different things so I can eat, you know, so I can be able to live. You know, it's tough for me here, but I made my way. I came a long way. So when I move, it's gonna be tough. Destroy Right now, they starting to set it up where they're just wanting to be families because the guy, Mike Ellis, bought up a lot of the property on over there in Cots. And they don't want men in the shelter. Families is all they want in that building. They didn't leave us with any explanation why we make it safer or what it would be doing or what's their process, what their plan or their goal is for that. They didn't leave us with nothing to know. They just left us clueless to, to wondering. But you don't have to wonder too hard about why the Illiches wouldn't want to keep a homeless shelter just a block away from where the new arena will be. Especially because around the arena, in the 45 block development zone, the Illiches will build a Mediterranean themed village within a city. There'll be upscale shops high-end residencies, and fountains and plazas. It'll be based off of a place in San Jose, California, called Santana Row. But the Santana Row in Detroit, 
It'll be called the District. And it will be even larger than downtown Detroit. The District, it will have five new neighborhoods. Or at least, what is here now will get new names. Each neighborhood has a logo and a distinct personality. For instance, Cass Park Village will be part entrepreneurial, part artistic, with personal expression in mind. That's what the Illich website says. This is Cass Park now, before it becomes a village. It was deeded to the city in 1860 to be used as a public park forever. Now it will be part of the entertainment district, controlled by the Illiches. Here is their model of the city, Illichville, of everything they own and hope to make and plan to build. The funny thing about progress, it's not something that's even. Some things that have been here a while in the corridor, they might not feel it at all. And some will feel the opposite. Like a lot of the stores in the corridor that have managed to stay open, Many are wondering how long they'll be able to as they watch places around them close. My next door neighbor, Laura's store, is one of those places. She used to run a laundry at the corner of our block. And the business had been in her family for 20 years. But she had to close it last year. Yeah, it got worse. Now we had these young boys out there, you know, selling drugs right in front of my door. Don't do it, you know. Yeah, it got worse. Ivan is someone else here who used to have a job in the corridor. He watched for shoplifters at the dollar store on Woodward. Now the store is closed and Ivan sits near the store, which he says they're planning on tearing down now, too. Jimmy's my last example of how it's not just the stores that are closing in the corridor, but the kinds of jobs that people had here, too. He still manages this apartment, but it just gives him a place to live. For years, Jimmy worked with George McMahon, the sociology teacher, doing roofing in the area. George says that he used to employ tons of people in the corridor, but most of those people are gone now. There's, there's not much work around here anymore. And there's no reason for Jimmy's to live around here anymore. So what will happen to those people? I don't know. I don't know. What is, where have they gone? I really, I really wonder where they've gone. This is a question a lot of people seem to be wondering. Jimmy himself was telling me where the prostitutes might have gone. So where'd they go? Maybe dead, I may have get seated, I may have, someone may have got themselves together, and the other thing left now is just a trap. Cause that cocaine, that play a major role that people just die okay. of money. Most, most, look at you, most of them died of whole that. Crack, cocaine. Are these the forgotten people? Are they going to just drop a bomb and get rid of them all or just pick them all up in a helicopter and drop them somewhere else? What's going to happen? And for some people in the area, it must feel like they have been picked up in a helicopter and dropped somewhere else. Leroy was eventually moved from the homeless shelter to the far west side of town. Another man from the homeless shelter was moved there too. It took me 
almost an hour to drive there. And neither of them drive. I don't think too many people stand back from their environment, look at their environment from a distance. What are the social and economic forces that are creating us? How do we harness them for the kind of a, a life that makes sense for, for everybody? so that everybody has a, has a place at the table. It's a question of ethnic and capital incursion that's meshed with the desire of people to want to have a safe and nice place to live. I think you can do both. You can do all, but you got to come in not as a conqueror, but you got to come in for consensus building. You know, this neighborhood has changed so fast. Can I go to sleep at night and wake up and see the same, the same neighborhood? People are being pushed out who've always made it their home. The buildings are being renovated to be something very different than, than what they always had been. You know, a place for the, for the poor, for the immigrant class to the city. The function of the city is changing. The role of the city is changing. And you can see especially in the Cass Corridor. A lot of the old-time Cass Corridor residents, there's a bit of resentment. There seems to be this effort to sort of wash away the history. Let's not even call it the Cass Corridor. We're going to rebrand it as Midtown. And that's that's a sticking point for a lot of old-timers. That they, they insist, we don't call it Midtown. This is the Cass Corridor. Cass Corridor, Cass Corridor, where John Sinclair and rock and roll, Detroit as you know it, and uh, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, and all of the other things that they know about in England, they know about it in Germany. Coming in and then you just change the name and you make a midtown, which is like putting white bread on stale cheese. Cass Corridor has a depth to it. Friends of mine that I knew, like Lily Tomlin, who lived in uh, Cass Corridor, uh, went to Cass Tech High School. Friends of mine who knew, who were like Southern Appalachian White people came up and meshed with black people and meshed with everybody else. It was the most multi-ethnic neighborhood in the city of Detroit. That's what the Cass Corridor was. I'd go to one of my Filipino friends' house and we'd eat their food. And my friend Chang back was Korean. We'd eat their food, and then you know, and eat soul food, and you know, <laughs> and boy, that's 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 an education. It's a great neighborhood. That's what you get. That's your reward for putting up with all the struggles is diversity, and with diversity comes many good towns, many good people. There's really a lot of unique things about Cass Corridor. People with a lot of character, people who have been tested, people who are not politically correct. I just want to know what you think about the new stadium that's planned. It's trying to erase uh, a history, a proud history, you know, and, a, and an interesting history. It's trying to erase a culture. It's an attempt to erase the culture. You see, Buddy used to come up this stairway here, and everybody would be assembled here. Now, this was a fence that was waist high, I suppose, along here. And she'd be leaning back on this fence, and I can just see her in my mind. My dad can still show me the house he lived in as a boy. But it's hard for me to imagine the neighborhood the way that he describes it. Because for me, it's only been something that's empty and something peaceful. But for him, the neighborhood only exists in his memory with street gangs, and neighborhood beauty queens, a place flooded with people, a place he might get to see again. <laughs>